So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first innovator of the day, uh, Bert Hamner, CEO and founder of Hydrovolts. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bert Hamner. I'm delighted to be here. It's a tremendous honor, and I want to thank the Launch Council for selecting me among the other distinguished applicants for this program. I can tell you already that I've made connections with two of the other innovators, and we're going to do some business together, which is already the point. And I'm here to tell you about our new product, which is a new renewable energy generator powered by water that will be able to fit into tens of millions of places around the world making between one to 10 kilowatts of energy individually, and then strung together, they can make a lot of power. Here you see it actually operating in an irrigation canal in Washington state. That machine is making enough power to keep a couple of car batteries charged up all the time. It weighs about 150 pounds, two people can put it in in 20 minutes. This is a culmination of many things in my life. My parents are marine biologists. I grew up in developing countries. I went to high school in Palau. I don't have a high school diploma. They don't really have a high school in Palau. And at college, I studied marine sciences and marine biology. And then after college, I worked in marine environmental permitting with the Corps of Engineers and other organizations. I worked for the Department of Ecology. I got an MBA and also a master's in marine studies. And then I ended up working for the state of Washington's Department of Ecology and Clean Technology, working with industry. And that led to a connection to USAID. In 1995, I moved to the Philippines with my family. And for the last 15 years, I've been working as a consultant to USAID in Southeast Asia and South America on clean technology promotion. In 2005, we moved back to the United States. And at that time, the city of Tacoma, Washington, was doing a study of ocean energy, tidal power. And because of my background, I was able to put together a team that won the consultancy to do the biggest study ever done in America on actually putting tidal power project together. We decided it was a bad idea. And we said, well, you know, the ocean's a very difficult place to work. Where can you do this with this technology where we don't have to deal with fish and whales and permits and everything else? And we decided, look at these irrigation canals of the world. Big flowing water systems controlled by engineers, and we developed a technology to tap it. The problem we're solving here is that billions of people around the world live near these water channels. They run through irrigated areas around the world, and yet billions of people have very little or no electricity. And as a consequence, they can't tap this energy. Now, the energy in these water channels is called hydrokinetic energy. It's different from the hydropower, and that hydrokinetic energy is a function of velocity, not pressure. So it's just the same type of physics as wind. And that's important because it means if the water goes twice as fast, the power increases with the cube of the velocity. Double the speed, get eight times the energy. So a small increase in speed means a lot more power. And here you see a typical irrigation canal running across a typical arid area. How many of these canals are out there? Well, in the western United States alone, the Bureau of Reclamation operates over 50,000 miles of main canals, and there's over a half million miles of privately owned canals. Pakistan has over 50,000 miles of main canals and a million miles of minor canals. Around the world, the numbers are at least in the millions of miles of artificial waterways that all have energy. And they all have this interesting problem. They're all almost all below grade. So if you want to get the water out of the canal, you've got to get it up. And that takes energy. So it's been untapped. The only way to tap that in the past has been with water wheels. We've invented a new device called a flip-wing turbine that installs in the water, it floats, it's held in place with ropes, it operates just like a paddle wheel, but because it is easily installed, it doesn't take any construction. There's no dam involved, there's no concrete, there's no civil engineering, and as a consequence, it's cheap. It's easy to put in quickly. And interestingly, in these artificial canals, there's no natural habitat. These are concrete lined ditches. There's no fish, there's no birds. We don't need environmental permits or even environmental assessments to do hydropower. We can do hydropower in an hour without permits in a million places now. And the impact is, of course, that it has, first of all, new energy for development. We can create new local economies by providing power where it hasn't been available in the past. 
And keep in mind, relative to other types of renewable energy, this is constant and predictable power. This is not solar or wind that goes on and off randomly. This power goes 24-7, never stops, so it's base load energy. Another thing about this is that if you can get the water out of that canal and onto that dry land, you can do new agriculture where you couldn't do before. And one of the exciting things about launch is I've been thinking all along about making electricity. You've opened up my mind to the idea that we can have a big impact by creating new food, new lands for growing food. We hadn't thought about that before. But that's the thing about these canals. They're canals because it's an arid area. That's why they need irrigation. And if they can get the water out without having to bring in transmission for power, we can grow more food where we couldn't before. We're also able to change the water paradigm itself. Canals are typically designed to be big and slow because erosion is the enemy of a canal. But now when canals are lined with concrete by making them more narrow, they can go a lot faster. And remember, double the speed, eight times the energy. So we're now talking to major canal construction companies to get them to understand they need to change the way they think about the physical infrastructure of water itself as a new way to create a global energy source. And because we're making a machine, we're able to create a new manufacturing center. I hope that you'll think about it this way, that the world is covered with highways of water and we're making the first car. But our car makes money instead of using money. We've been recognized by a number of great organizations. Uh, we started off with the Tacoma Power, obviously, the title study. <coughs> the University of Washington has helped us out. We've won several contests, the Clean Tech Open, the Imagine H2O contest this year, and now we're very honored to be working with Launch and also with the U.S. Navy. We have a great team to do this, too. Besides my own background with USAID and a lot of marine and environmental technology, we have staff with experience from general dynamics and heavy manufacturing the U.S. Navy, industrial process controls, and also with uh, small business acceleration. Atlas Accelerator is a company that's invested in over 100 small startups, and they're on our board, and they're investors in us as well. So our product is a floating turbine. It looks like a lawnmower reel. It's held in place with ropes. The rotor is suspended between, on a shaft between two pieces at the end. We call them the end caps. The generators are inside these end caps. And the power from the generators just goes right up the anchor rope, wrapped around the cable, up to the shore. These designs are completely scalable. They can be small, they can be big, it can be made to any size. It can be put into a box and shipped. The biggest one we're going to make is going to be about 18 feet long and 7 feet in diameter. That means it fits into a 20-foot shipping container. And I can airmail a turbine to anybody. And because it's adjustable in size and scale, we can adjust easily to fit whatever water course we have available. So this is the way the new flip wing turbine works. What we have here are flat paddles that are, could be made of plywood, they could be made out of aluminum, we're using just sheet aluminum. They're suspended from an outside shaft on a disc and you're looking at the end of this, this is an end on view of the shaft. And so those blades are just long enough so that they reach to the center shaft and that center shaft pins the blade which then is pushed over the top by the water. It has fascinating characteristics. The first one is that it's, A, really easy to make. Unlike any other kind of propeller, this is just flat sheets, which means anybody with a saw and a piece of plywood can make a turbine. Second, it's very hard to stop it spinning because it's self-clearing. Things that float along the surface go right over the top. Things that come along the bottom, like weeds that wrap around the blade as it goes around and flips, it flips it off the back. And we that initial video I showed you, that's our turbine spinning in a canal. It ran for 30 days, uninterrupted. There were weeds and bags on the anchor ropes, but nothing stopped that turbine from spinning. It's also safe for fish because it turns slower than the water speed itself. It's resisting the water, so it has to go slower than the water. So to a fish or to a person in the water, it acts a lot like a log. It can't whack anything hard. So although the thing itself is hard to make, the submersible generators for electricity are not easy to make, and our business model is to have the fabrication of most of the turbines be done in shops close to the customers, which are going to typically be in developing countries with lots of irrigation, and then we will supply them with the high-tech generators. Now on this same system, we can use multiple types of rotors that fit different types of water courses. We call this the switchblade turbine, actually. So in the upper left, you see a high-speed rotor with Darius-style blades, as we call them designed for fast flows. 
It's more efficient at high speed than the other designs. On the right, you see a barrel rotor, which you'll see in action in a waterfall in a minute. That's designed for waterfalls and spillways. The lower left, you see a Savonius design, which is a very robust but kind of inefficient design. And then the lower right, our flip wing design, which has those interesting characteristics. The key point here is that we have a standard chassis on which we can do different types of bodies, in other words. So think of it as we've invented the chassis and the wheels of a car on which you can build a pickup truck or a bus or a sedan or whatever else you need. And that's key to making this affordable because that means you can have one standard platform that can be mass produced in high volume. So the models are a small turbine, the class one. This is about this big, you can pick it up. It's a little heavy now, but it's getting engineered for lighter weight. It's designed to charge batteries. The US Navy is testing it now, and you'll see some video of that. And this is able to provide 24 volts at 24 amps to run two car batteries quickly, charge them up, so you can power things in remote areas. And the US Marine Corps calls this expeditionary energy, and they're actually have a, we're making a proposal to them now. The class two turbine you see is about the size of a small car. Here you see it delivered to a canal on a small truck. A crane would come out and pick it up, or you can roll it down the side of the canal. It's tied off to whatever is handy. In this case, it's tied off to this little bridge across the canal, and you can install it in a few hours. And that includes everything from drilling a hole to put the cable in to tying it up to actually. So we had this in the water from the time we showed up in one hour from the time the truck arrived at the site. And that canal is 90 miles long, just that one canal, 90 miles long, and we can put them in every couple hundred feet. The class three turbine is the largest machine. You can see me there with one of our engineers. This is designed to make from five to 10 kilowatts. This picture is useful because as you can see from that big silver disc at the end, that's the anchor plate. We can stick the turbines together end to end to end. So if we have a wide water body, we can stick them together like Lego blocks. We can also stack them in a deeper water body. And again, the whole point is to make it modular and scalable. Never make the machines too big that you can't put them in an airmail box and send them somewhere. The waterfall turbine you see here is a brand new discovery of ours. We built this originally to sit on spillways, and we've just discovered a new market for this. This is installed in a wastewater treatment plant. And what we've discovered is water treatment and wastewater treatment factories, where they're running rivers of water through these big industrial facilities, have got these drops. There's 27,000 publicly owned treatment works in the United States, and at least 1,000 of them are big enough to have really serious power potential here. And just last week, the city of Vancouver, British Columbia, sent us a request for a proposal for two of these machines. So we're already building this. And this, I'm very happy to say, is in the water right now in a wastewater treatment plant in Washington State. It went in yesterday. Yay, team. So our customers are not farmers. They're not individuals. We're going to target the engineering entities that own and move the water. In the United States, these would be irrigation districts. In other countries, they could be governments. The key thing about these customers is that they're big engineering technical organizations, okay? And the thing about these water flows is they move the water when they want to, so the resource is predictable and dispatchable. On any given day, they can tell you that the water there will have this much power. They know because they let the water into the canals themselves. So unlike wind and solar, this is predictable and dispatchable and base load power. And the customers can either use the power themselves or they can sell it back to the grid. I won't get into the details on the math here, but we're designing the pricing for this so that a customer in a market that pays 11 cents a kilowatt for power, which is the US national average, will have a payback of five to six years. Now, that's a price around the world that's about average from country to country. And it's very conservative. We're basing our payback and our economics purely on the local cost of power, not including any incentives, any grants, any offsets, any carbon credits. All of those will make the payback faster for the customer using this product. Now, where else would you make money with it? Well, this all depends on the cost of power around the world. Here you see on the bottom bar there, that's the US average, where 11 cents a kilowatt is the average, and a six-year payback. But in the United Kingdom right now, they're paying 30 to 35 cents a kilowatt for small hydro which means in the United Kingdom, the payback's gonna be one to two years for these machines. And of course, if you have no power at all, what's the value of having power for the first time? Well, it's transformative, obviously. 
So our first customer, though, was not a big U.S. company. It turned out to be a company from the United States doing hydropower projects in India. And on the lower left, you see the picture of the Chilla Canal in the far northwest of India. This is a huge 14-kilometer canal. You can see from the wake on that bridge strut, it's going four knots or, or two meters a second. And they're buying three turbines from us already. They've paid for them, and they want 400 more just for this one canal. These turbines, we expect, will cost about $40,000 each. So our first customer has a letter of interest to us worth about $14 million from our first sale. Now, our, India is an exciting opportunity, but we're a little company. And obviously, going to India as a little company is a pretty risky proposition. So we're focused on easy markets, relatively speaking, namely the Western United States, where we've identified, based on existing districts, and by the way, we can see where to put these turbines because you can see them all from Google Earth. A, a canal lined with concrete has got white edges and you can see them from space. And I can sit at my desk in Seattle and tell you where I can put turbines in Wyoming. And so we've identified that there's potential out there for as many as 80,000 units. And at an average price of 20,000, that's our middle-sized turbine, potential market just in the Western USA of over a billion dollars. Now, international markets, of course, are much, much bigger, and they also pay more. Areas with huge canal systems include Europe, India, Southeast Asia, et cetera. But other industries are thermal power plants that discharge cooling water. They operate huge rivers of water through their systems. Wastewater and water treatment, as I mentioned. Water purification, the mining industry makes their own rivers by digging up the land. And in fact, one of them has proposed investing in our company, and we're talking to them now. And then the mili military, as I mentioned. So we compete against other sources of energy, really, against diesel, wind, solar, and other types of hydropower. And our basic proposition is that our system is easy, fast, safe, and doesn't require permits. And it's infinitely scalable, as far as we can tell. There are some other companies in this space making hydrokinetic turbines, but they're either too expensive, for example, three times the cost for a vertical axis machine, or they're targeting tidal and river channels, in which case they're making huge machines that cost millions of dollars, take forever to get installed, and need lots of permits. We're the only company that we know of that's focused on this product and in this space. And because the machine is simple to mass produce, a standard machine can go into a standard canal. And a canal in my state of Washington is no different than a canal in India or Argentina. So we have something that can scale very, very quickly. Again, imagine the world covered with highways of water, and there's no cars yet. So we have the first car. So our program now is to raise more funds to help us develop our product. We've already raised a million dollars plus. I have 35 investors, including four corporate investors. But we know we need to grow. And I'm delighted to be here at launch because we need help, of course. We need help to build and install our first turbines, and we're looking for demonstration partners. We're also looking for uh, new talent. I am an entrepreneur and a marine biologist. I've never run a global manufacturing company, and I need to replace myself. So I'm looking to launch to help get information about good people to bring onto the team, because this business is not about innovation so anymore. We've done that. Now we have to execute, 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 and I need a world-class team to do it. And we also need money for patents, because no one else has ever done this before. And it's going to be easy to copy the machine, because it's so simple. So we're going to be in patent wars in five years against the copycats. And we're going to need capital for that and help against, with that as well. Fortunately, there's a lot of grants that are available to help our customers reduce the cost of purchase and help subsidize our business. And we're looking for partnerships with big organizations, USAID and other international development agencies, obviously, but also with big companies that have a strategic alignment. For example, the big companies that run water systems. And here you see some of them. We're also looking for help with technology development. Our generator design is rather unusual, so NASA and JPL and other organizations with good engineering skills are places that we could really use some help. We also want some help with data transmission. All of our turbines are going to have a cell phone on them with GPS. So if the turbine is suddenly floating down the canal where it's not supposed to be, we'll know, because it'll call home and say, help. But it'll also transmit the data about what it's doing. And that's important, as we just heard, because then you can monitor what you're doing for carbon offsets, power generated, and have that data logged all around the world. So we're really trying to change the water energy game. We've discovered a way to make power in a million places. And here you see a, one of our turbines. This is tested just 
a month ago at the U.S. Navy in Bethesda, Maryland. That turbine is about six feet long. It's about as tall as me. It's about this wide. It's making 500 watts, which is the U.S. Marines and Navy target. It's able to be installed by one or two people in 20 minutes. It's held in place with ropes. And that could be a 90 mile or 100 mile long canal. And we can put these in one after another like the rungs on a rope ladder floating downstream. And then they can all be strung together to a single power source so you can make big power. If you can make new power, you can do new things, and there's a world of new applications. Not just for canal power, but we're also discovering this is something that can power sensors in the ocean. They only need five watts, perhaps, to run a sensor, but those five watts are at the bottom of the sea. It's very expensive to produce those five watts. And a final thing that's exciting to us is that we don't have to make electricity with this machine. We can use it just to pump water. Our big turbine in a good site can produce 7,000 foot-pounds of torque at the shaft, which means we can push a lot of water a long way under high pressure. That means you can run into reverse osmosis units and make clean drinking water. So imagine a machine that's making clean power on one end and drinking water on the other end. It's a fully scalable system, and I hope that launch innovators and everybody else will never look at flowing water the same way again without saying, you need a hydrovolt right there. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, and he mentioned the statistic in the beginning of the presentation. It was 50,000 miles of canal managed by federal lands in the western United States. Just, yes, just the Bureau of Reclamation, and they have a database of them all, and we know exactly where they all are and who runs them. So I'm a very visual person. I wanted to know what 50,000 miles was. It's basically driving from Kennedy Space Center to HydroVotes headquarters in Seattle. in Seattle 16 or 17 times on the highway. That's, that's a big distance. I think that's a huge opportunity. So with that, um, we have about 10 minutes for questions or so. Guy? Uh, several questions. Guy Lay from uh, Intel Labs. Um, so um, at what point do you have to worry about uh, sucking so much power out of the stream that you, it no longer scavenges the canal? Uh, the canals are driven by gravity. First of all, if you're pumping the water into something, putting an obstacle in the way just makes you pump harder. So it's got to be a gravity-driven system. So each turbine acts like a little dam in the canal. And as long as that little backup of water behind the dam doesn't get into the entrance of the canal, what goes in this end comes out that end. Otherwise, it has to go somewhere else. So as long as you don't overflow the edges of the canal, you don't affect the throughput. What happens is the canal holds more water, and then it's under constant acceleration due to gravity. So in fact, you can't prevent the water from getting to the other end at the same rate. You're harvesting gravity. This is really a gravity-powered renewable energy generator. Elver Kozvik, Ocean Tomo. Question about uh, minimum water flow. So you say 50,000 miles, but what's, if you do a map of your efficiency, where is your best efficiency and, and how much, uh, uh, what percentage of the canals that are out there are below where you can be useful? Well, the, we're targeting canals that are typically, we call them main canals or feeder canals, and from them there's distribution to what are called lateral canals. So the main canals that we're working on typically have a flow rate of 1,000 CFS or more. They're big. They're typically 7 to 8 feet deep, 30 to 40 feet wide. And again, there's thousands and thousands of miles of them, and we can quantify them in a given area simply by using Google or other satellite imagery to see them. So we believe that out of the 50,000 miles that the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation operates, about 15 to 20 percent of that is usable. So perhaps you know, five to 8,000 miles just in those canal systems are fast enough. And the, and the speed we want is a fast walk, two meters a second or four knots. That's a fast walk, okay? It's not running, but if you're tossing something in to catch up with it, you'll be walking pretty fast to do it. We've got a couple room for time for a couple more questions. Nick and then Nagesh. Uh, Nick Sinai, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, what are your uh, initial or target customers going to do with the energy? Are they going to sell it back into the grid, or are they going to use it for, for their own purposes? What's the, the use case for the energy? Uh, for the ones that we're actually talking to now, and those include the Fresno Irrigation District, Richvale, California, three districts in, in Arizona, and then, of course, in India, as I mentioned, they're going to use the power themselves to offset pumping costs. 
for a lot of these districts, running pumps is their biggest cost of all. And in fact, one of these districts spends over a million dollars a year on electricity. So they're going to use what they can right themselves. If they have excess, most of these districts in the western USA also have transmission nearby because we have transmission in the United States. So they can tap into the grid and sell it back in. The individual turbines for an interconnect typically don't make much power from 5 to 10 kilowatts. That's in the net metering space. So the utilities are making it relatively easy, and I say the word relatively with caution because uh, utilities are interesting to work with, um, but they can make it relatively easy to tap into their grid. If, uh, if you have a lot of turbines strung together, then you have more power and the interconnection's a bigger deal, but that's a matter of doing the math. The key for them is once they've got two machines in and they know how close they can put them together, the rest is a simple calculation. What can you get out of the canal? And then you take it to the bank. This is really great stuff. Uh, actually, two things. One, uh, I didn't get a chance to tell people yesterday, but for federal funding opportunities, I encourage you to check out green.sba.gov. It just got launched uh, about a month ago by a couple of my friends over there. It's a green procurement portal for federal funding opportunities. So green.sba.gov. Wanted to let you know about that for everyone else. Uh, secondly, um, the IP strategy. I just wanted to know a little bit more about what countries you've filed patents for so far and where, where are you thinking you're going from there? We have filed a uh, utility patent on the flip wing and a provisional on the switchblade. The utility patent is about a year away from being issued, we assume. And we have filed under the PCT Patent Cooperation Treaty in China, India, Japan, South Korea, uh, Chile, Canada, and one other, which I'm going to blank on. So, but there's a total of eight countries in all, including the USA. And we're limited in how many we can file because uh, our, we have now learned that if you want to file a patent and protect it in 10 countries around the world for five years, you have to have a budget of $100,000 per patent. So patents are pricey. Do we have time for one more? Um, I know David and Daniel have been waiting. Um, Daniel, you want to go first? And yeah, mine's just really quick about um you know, the testing, how far along you are, what kind of dur durability you guys, uh, you know, have shown so far, and what, you know, the failure mechanisms you expect, uh, you know, you're going to get to. Sure. Uh, the turbines have been tested for up to a month, and then we've also tested all of them for power generation, so we're already hitting our power targets. As to durability, they've only been in existence for the last couple of months, really, and so we're now going into long-term testing, and I'm happy to announce that last month, we got the first ever federal license agreement for installation of turbines and canals. So they're going in next week, in fact. Now my question was in, involved with your grid connections. Sure. Have you taken a look at your, your map to see where it makes sense to be able to hook up with the grid? Because that doesn't work for everywhere, and especially not a lot of the places you're talking about with the canals. Sure. And in fact, where we're targeting to grow is in California because California has very high energy cost and huge amounts of canals. And we're now partners with the Fresno Water Energy Technology Center. In fact, we're their, one of their newest, their newest corporate member. So we're going to be targeting the states in the western USA with the highest cost of power and the highest density of canal systems. That's also the rationale for choosing the countries where we filed our, P, our patent applications. So the grid interconnection in those places is usually pretty straightforward. They already have renewable portfolio standards, and they also are making it relatively easy, and I always, you know, to connect small systems to the grid, like small wind and solar. Thank you. I think that's about all the time we have, we have all afternoon. Um, Bert, thank you again very much. Thanks a lot.